Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to our talk. This is a look under the hood of CNCF security audits. My name is Adam Kuczynski, and I'm giving this uh, talk together with David Kuczynski. This is the agenda for our talk. We will go through what the CNCF security audits are, the internal mechanics of the audits, some insights and results and outcomes from six security audits that we have carried out and how the community can get involved in the ongoing security work. You may have seen stuff like this on Twitter or the CNCF's own blog or uh, a project, a CNCF project's own, uh, blog as well. Um, and in this talk, we go through the work that goes into getting to this place where we announce the findings and we, we wrap up the security audit. So uh, the projects that we, we have audited uh, over the last year, so this will be a talk about six audits we have done throughout the last year, maybe a little bit more than last year, and these are the projects, Argo, Cilium, Cryo, Istio, QBedge, and Flux. So we will mainly be speaking out of these. Sometimes we will generalize to a bit more audits because there's more CNCF security audits going on, and there will also be some insights about that. So uh, the position of CF, CNCF security audits, in particular those that we talk about now, is first and foremost, they are made available by the CNCF itself, and then also the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund. And both of these organizations help um, commission the audits and facilitate them, help some of the communication with the maintainers and, and all sorts of things that are necessary to carry out these audits. So uh, thanks a lot to both of these organizations. And in a sense, because both of the organizations that get this work uh, sort of started, it is like a goal is in that sense becomes we want to make open source security audits. That means a lot of the things that happens in the audit are in fact open to, for everyone to see. And it's an ongoing effort. There are some links to some blog posts that summarize uh, audits of a lot more projects than, than just these six months. And uh, this is also just uh, these security audits that we present here are also just a, a small part of the whole engagement that CNCF does in terms of securing the CNCF landscape. Other things include uh, sort of security automation by way of fuzzing, and we included a, a small blog post here, which summarizes a lot of the, the results from that. So what is a CNCF, CNCF security audit? It's kind of a, it's a time boxed engagement, although it's a bit flexible. So usually uh, the actors involved are the project maintainers, the auditors, Adam and I, and then also the facilitators, OSTIF, Open Source Technology Improvement Fund. And on average, it takes around six weeks uh, a, a project. Approximately four of those weeks are like full-time work, looking at a project and doing all the work. And then there's a follow-up period where we show them, a, a, show the maintainers a report. We share a lot of the findings. We go over fixes. We kind of like there's like a, a, almost like a post-processing to all the work done, all the like core work. And um, in general, we call it a holistic approach to, to security because we don't just look at the, the code and report a bunch of issues and that's it. We do a, a lot of things such as we look at the threat modeling uh, of, of a given project. We look at the documentation. We do a lot of security, it's sort of code auditing. ordering. We in integrate automation tools as well. And in, in essence, look at the security from, of, the, of the projects from a first principle perspective almost. We want to understand what their needs are. And each project has a different set of needs and also a different set of preferences with, with respect to security. Uh, so that also involves a lot of essentially discussion with the maintainers. So in a, in a little bit more pragmatic way, at CNCF security audit, the output of that is a set of upstream code changes, either fixes or something uh, in that, of that nature. Upstream documentation changes, for example, if a project is, if you deploy it in a, in a sort of like 
default way has some insecure settings, this needs to be specified, or if you use some settings, this needs to be specified, and, and stuff like that. It's all, it, the output of a CNCF security audit is also uh, usually a list of security advisories detailing some of the, the findings. It's also an audit report, and then also an audit announcement, which were the, the, the links Adam showed. So, what are the, the sort of the process or the mechanics of a CNCF security audit? Usually, we Ada Logics and the facilitators will have an introductory meeting with the with the maintainers, where we are going to just set up the the, the management of the of the project, discuss communication channels, outline expectations, and let them let the maintainers tell us a little bit of what they think is important from a security posture. They will often guide us in a certain direction, tell us about a certain piece of code that is recent or has some comp complexity in it and, and so on, which can help us sort of guide the focus areas of the audit. We then have the, what we call the audit process, which is like the main, basically the four weeks. And we regular, hold regular meetings during those four weeks uh, where we just discuss the status. And these are either weekly or biweekly. And then we also have a lot of sort of ongoing communication based on the findings that, 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 that we find. Um, and the output, I already went through that, upstream code changes. So all of the work we do is essentially uh, aligned with what the maintainers want. So if you are a maintainer of a CNCF project, we will kind of engage with you on your terms. And I've included a link here to uh, CNCF, maintains a list of all the security audit reports of all the CNCF projects that are out there, at least the ones they commission. And I think in the link that I show here, there's around 50 uh, reports, sorry, 50 uh, audit reports approximately, maybe a little less. And this is so like, this has happened since I think 2016 or so. So to give you an example of how a, a report looks and what the audit specifically contains, here's a uh, the table of contents of the Istio service mesh uh, report, where the first sort of like first couple of, 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 of bullet points in the table of contents are just table of contents, executive summary, notable findings, project summary, so fairly sort of small uh, paragraphs. And then we come down to, uh, for example, we have a bullet point with fussing, which introduces how we set up continuous fussing for Istio. We come up with a threat model we then list the issues found, which has basically the, the largest part of the report from page 17 to 50. And then we also have, in this case, a salsa compliance review, which is a software supply chain assessment. So what's perhaps to take away from this is that it is really holistic in that there's a lot of content in it, a lot of different things. And not all projects will have the exact same table of content, but usually they will have quite a selection of, of different activities and not just here are all the issues found or here's the salsa supply chain review and so on. The results summarized usually looks something like this and this is also taken from the Istio example where we kind of like try to highlight the most important bits relative to the audience of the report and the audience of the report is not always clear. Sometimes we write the report with the intention of communicating it only to the maintainers. Sometimes it's both to the customers of the given open source project. Sometimes it's to some. So essentially the, the audience is not always, uh, the, there's, there's a lot of different people looking at the reports. So we have to encapsulate a, a bit of everything. But usually it lists amongst, amongst others the, the issues found. Um, we also have for each of the issues that we find a, a highly technical description. So this is just a, a sort of introduction to a given issue found, but we usually have a highly technical description with code issues and so on for the given report. So if you are a developer, if you sit in a company and use Istio, you should be able to read the report and quickly go over where is it that it's, or like what are the, the code issues and, and quickly access whether, for example, your organization is uh, affected or not. Um, Here's a list of, of, of all, if you're interested, this is more of an artifact slide where you can see uh, the announcements of all of the, the six audits that we're talking about in, in, this, in this presentation. So let's go through some of the goals and um, 
focus areas that we uh, look at when we audit uh, the CNCF uh, projects. Uh, first of all, we, we look at the threat model. Um, this, is, this usually starts in the, or oh, so far it has always started in, from the start of the audit um, and uh, kind of guides all efforts uh, in, the, in the audits. Um, and some, some things that we look at in the threat model are um, the attack surface. And that, that is, an attack surface is the area where an, an, uh, a malicious actor could um, seek to, to penetrate the system, so to say, to, to, um, to launch an attack. Then we look at who the threat actors are. And um, these are personas that could be malicious, but not necessarily are. Um, but we typically see, seek to map a, a given vulnerability to a threat actor uh, when, when we do the, audit, uh, the code auditing later in the audit. Um, then we map out uh, the threat actor's goals, um, what they seek to do, um, their, and the priority of uh, the different, uh, we, we try to map the priority of uh, what an attacker may seek uh, to achieve uh, when launching an, an attack. Um, then we put ourselves in the position of an attacker, thinking, what, what, what would we do if we were malicious? Uh, one of the things we would then look at, uh, if we were malicious, were um, particularly uh, critical code parts. And that can be um, if particularly interesting things happen in the code that, that could be dangerous if an attacker could uh, uh, achieve uh, control over that uh, part of the code. And then we also consider whether an attacker can do fairly low, um, low effort attacks to, uh, to, to, uh, yeah, to achieve control and malicious control over the, the project. Then we uh, go through the code base of the audit of the project under audit, um, and we map. We, we when we do that, we, we think of the threat model all throughout. Uh, and one of the things that we look at is whether the project defends against the threats and the threat actors identified in, during threat modeling. We then look for vulnerabilities in the code, um, co code, uh, code issues, um, design, design issues, etc. Um, and we, yeah, we, uh, during that process, we, we also look at read, read code parts, um, uh, which. Sim, which, which we, in, in which we think of whether a, a certain component is hardened enough against potential attacks. Then we think of, of the code base from a general perspective, whether it's, uh, the, the general approach to security is, uh, is mature. And, and an example of, of a finding from, uh, from the manual code auditing, auditing part is, uh, looks something like this. David mentioned that an output are security advisories, and this is an example from the uh, audit that we did with the Cryo project, uh, where we found this high severity CVE um, in, uh, in one of the, uh, yeah, in one of the APIs here in exec sync. Next, we look at the security tooling of, uh, of the project. Uh, how, how is static analysis, how, is how, how do they, how much dynamic analysis do they do? Um, and whether this is set up to run continuously uh, and as well in the CI pipeline. For example, we look at the fuzzing efforts of a given project, um, and here we highlight why fuzzing is very important um, with reference to the OSS Fuzz project um, that has found uh, almost 9,000 vulnerabilities by way of fuzzing open source projects. And this is open only in open source projects. And it's worth, men worth mentioning here that CNCF has approximately 30 projects integrated into CNCF. And I think the accumulated set of bugs found by these integrations is, is if we exclude two or three projects, which are like big players, it's around 400 or so issues, I think. Not all, but there will be false positives, but it's a lot. And then if we include also the one, like the big players, which are memory unsafe programs, they will usually have a lot more found by fuzzing, but then we are in the thousands easily. So CNCF does have a lot of, uh, gets a lot of impact from, from this type of like integrating, in particular fuzzing into their, their, their projects. 
Yeah, David mentioned that CNCF does this um, in another engagement, more focused, uh, and um, they regularly publish uh, blog posts about this on their blog. Next, we look at the security advisory disclosure process of uh, the given project. Um, and we, def we primarily consider maturity here and industry standards. So we, we consider what, what happens. First of all, we consider whether a, an open source contributor uh, can even submit and file a, an advisory or a disclosure. Um, and this involves having a proper security policy uh, in place that both exists as well as outlines what should be included. Um, other things we think of um, when we consider the security disclosure uh, policy is um, what, what are the promises, uh, do they follow in industry uh, standards, for example, um, when does the project aim to follow up, uh, what are the follow-up uh, steps for the, for the contributors. And our goal here is to make it easy for uh, contributors with good intentions to contribute uh, security work to the CNCF projects. We want to make sure that the community can be engaged in a positive way. Next, we look at the general source code ma uh, ma maintenance, um, the review process, the CI pipeline. Um, we look at the inline documentation for example, are there uh, excessive uh, misses in terms of to-dos that have already been resolved, um, which uh, can have deeper underlying issues if, uh, uh, at, at times. Then we look at dead code, which interestingly used often have some kind of uh, security issues. Uh, and um, in those cases, the maintainers just uh, remove the dead code. Um, but that is an interesting area because uh, it may be dead now uh, or when we perform the audit, but um, an, a, a, contributor, a contributor may find it, find or seek to use that later um, uh, and may use uh, vulnerable code by, by accident. Then we look at something uh, like the, the, the exported or the public uh, and internal APIs, whether they are, the assumptions here are correct then we look at the release process of the, the artifacts. Uh, some things we look at are who, who can build the release artifacts, the environment they were built in, um, how and where, um, the, how the secrets are managed during the build process. Uh, and then we look at uh, whether the provenance, whether the project issues a provenance statement. Um, and with regards to the environment, we look at something like isolation, um, whether it's running with or without net network co connectivity, how, the, uh, how it is connected to the outer world when the artifact is being built, um, or whether the environment is provisioned solely for, uh, for building the artifact or whether it's reused for other purposes. And, and a pitfall here may be if a developer builds it on their local machine, then the environment may be exposed to a bunch of, uh, of uh, security issues. And it's worth mentioning here that the bullet points on the right are really just how compliant are, uh, is, a, is a given open source project with CELSA, which is this uh, OpenSSF uh, sort of, oh, it comes now. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So like David mentioned, um, CELSA, uh, we can start with the problem here that uh, there was this solar winds issue um, in, in 2020, and in response to that, um, some uh, op some open source efforts were uh, put in place to create the Salsa framework, which um, aims to counter threats uh, which were imposed on, which were visible in which in the solar winds attack, and uh, some um, actors have claimed that Salsa would have countered. Uh, solar winds, the solar winds attack. It was certainly uh, a goal with Salsa, and solar winds also adopted the the Salsa framework in their own pipeline, release pipeline. And we want to uh, ensure the same for the CNCF projects that um, that they have standards like this in their own release processes. Then we look at deployment. 
uh, and usage from a user perspective. And the overall thought here is whether a user can use this product securely or whether they will, um, and which should not be the case, whether they will deploy it and do a bun make a bunch of mistakes in their security when they deploy uh, the product. And some things here are whether the, the product is secure by default, um, whether documentation is in place to um, make sure that adopters can uh, deploy the products securely, and whether all trade-offs are uh, documented probably, probably. And uh, a trade-off is, for example, um, that some users may prefer some insecure settings, which is fine in their own deployment, um, and not fine for other users that deploy the, the product in another manner. And, and a part of that is, for example, in which environment you deploy the product. Uh, if you only use it internally and you have to go through a lot of, a bunch of uh, security measures to get to the product, authentication, for example, if you deploy, deploy a product behind authentication, then it's, it's fine to assume a little uh, less security, a little lower security posture, uh, whereas other users that expose the product without authentication to the internet um, should be uh, more careful. So let's talk about some of the security findings uh, from the six audits that we have carried out. So like David mentioned, we are, the, we are behind the technical part of the security audit. So we, we look, we, we go through all these steps and, and these are, and, and in total we have identified over the six audits, 89 security issues. And these are not code vulnerabilities, uh, all of them. They, these are security issues across all the uh, different measures that we went through in the previous five or so slides. I think most most of them, uh, most of the moderate, high, and, and critical are code issues. Uh, usually, they, they they go a little bit more hand in hand. Yeah, completely. So uh, the documentation issues uh, may spill over into the moderate, but are typically in the lower part of severity. So yeah, to go through 20 informational, 32 low. Uh, 28 moderate security issues, one high and one critical. And this critical was a uh, uh, security vulnerability. Uh, and of the 89 security issues, uh, 21 was, were, uh, CVEs were assigned. Uh, and to go through those, one was not scored. That was uh, actually a, se a security vulnerability in Golang that was found during the Istio audit. Um, this is CVSS severity, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is CVSS scoring. Uh, one was not scored, and I, so Golang, I believe, doesn't score their vulnerabilities, and, and this one wasn't. Uh, then we, we found one low uh, uh, CV, 13 moderate, six high, and one critical. Of the classes of vulnerabilities that we have found, um, we can list these seven, one command injection, two arbitrary file rates, one case of sending sensitive data, data over an unencrypted connection. Um, and I should mention that command, command injection is in case um, the, 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 the program executes some kind of commands and you are able to uh, manage some parameters uh, to, in that process. Arbitrary file reads is when a threat actor is able to read files uh, from outside, so to say, uh, sending sensitive uh, data over an unencrypted connection could allow traffic sniffing and uh, capturing this sensitive data. But then we have found 13 cases of denial of service, which is um, where a threat actor can uh, disrupt the availability of the given software pro product. Two cases of cross-site scripting, um, which is uh, the ability to execute uh, code in the browser. One use of uh, insecure cryptographic primitive for sensitive data and one case of uh, HTTP request smuggling. So when, when we uh, carried out these audits, we uh, 
we, um, most of the projects have already had uh, ongoing or previous security work. And um, one thing that we find is that, so, so when, when repeated uh, security efforts does pay off, and we have seen that in multiple cases. One case of, of uh, this was the, the, during our Argo project, um, where the, the project had, had a security audit uh, conducted in 2021, um, the researchers found, or the auditors found, 57 security issues. And one year later, we, they had another security audit in which we, uh, we found 26 security issues and nine CVEs. And this is not uh, an isolated example of, of ongoing uh, rewards from ongoing security work. The SDO audit, um, during our SDO audit, so when we conducted it in 2022, we found 11 security issues, and during the process, the Istio maintainers, um, when they were triaging one of our reports, found a CVE in Golang. And in their audit one year before, they, the auditors found 18 issues. And as well with the cryo, um, in, in our cryo audit, um, so... Yeah, go ahead. In the cryo audit, like the example here is that more efforts give more results. And when we started cryo, it was just a few months after uh, critical security vulnerability was reported in cryo. So even though there had been some private auditing going on by, in this case, some CrowdStrike researchers, there were still a, a, a few issues to be found um, in cryo. So I guess this is also, a, a, in a sense, a call to, uh, well, more resources help find more issues. And interestingly, uh, the this was actually, so we reported an issue to cryo and then the cryo maintainers were excellent at and handling it and also identifying that this issue actually affects some other pieces of software. So they should also have some credit in terms of promote, like propagating the issues found, um, which was great. So getting involved. Um, so all of the work is shared publicly and a goal of the audits is to essentially get more people to come and, and help promote the security of these, these projects. This is also why, why some of the reports are made in a way that if you are a security researcher and you read it, you will sort of know what the next steps are in terms of, or it should be easy to identify what some next steps are in order to approach the security and analyze the security of a given software. So when we have done this audit, we by no means have like, that's not the finished work in a sense. There's still a lot more to do usually. And the way to get involved, read the reports, understand the threat model in particular. Some projects are, are, are very focused on that. They don't, sort of, they, the way they consider vulnerabilities might be different from what, for example, what a, a security, re security researcher considers a vulnerability. Uh, carry out your own auditing and report the vulnerabilities to, to the projects. Right, and in some case, for example, for example, shout out to the Argo project that has a bug bounty in place and you may be able to collect a reward um, when, if, if you submit a successful uh, disclosure. Which they put in place after the audit, right? Yeah. So that's, that's a, another great example from Argo where after the audit, they saw the, the benefit of sort of having third parties come and address security issues in the project and that made them set up a, a, a bug bounty which allegedly they have had, had, had good results from. And uh, when, when, you, when you or anyone in the community submits disclosures to these projects, uh, try and be helpful and uh, in, include as much of your uh, work that you can in terms of, uh, even if you can provide a fix or uh, your own root cause analysis, etc. Uh, the more, more information about your in your disclosure typically means a uh, quicker turnaround time. Conclusions. So, CNCF carried out, carries out security audits continuously. They sponsor it to have organizations like us come and address these projects. We work closely with the maintainers. The goal is really to like, make it a community effort as much as possible. And we try to sort of let the maintainers guide us uh, as much as they want. Um, and so far it has been pretty successful. Um, the goal of the audits is both to look at the, 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 the source code, like specifically the code, but also the, the whole ecosystem around the software. And uh, in the audits, in the audits we, we, six audits we carried out, 
found just about 90 issues with 20 CVEs. Um, we also did a, a lot of improvements in sort of in, in, in the context of security automation. So it's not just the issues that matter. In general, it's probably half of, of what we consider that matters. There's a lot of integrated, automated security tooling after a given audit, as we consider sort of the continuity of the security really important. And uh, CCF maintains a list of all security audits. Please do check out this list. Um, if you are dependent on a project, if you're willing to be interested in, like if you're interested in engaging with them, I'm sure that they're happy to. Um, that's it from our side. Thank you very much.